but chair of the Public Health and Safety Committee, I truly appreciate everybody's time uh, coming this evening. Um, so tonight is the second in a series of three special meetings of the Metro Council's Public Health and Safety Committee. So our first meeting was last Wednesday in the council chamber, and it focused on how we as Metro Council members can be supportive of our Metro Schools and Metro Police Department as their collaboration and efforts continue to evolve and strengthen. We also heard from State Representatives Caleb Hemmer and Bob Freeman on the possible special session of the state legislature that has still yet to be confirmed. So I'm happy to announce that at last week's meeting, it produced tangible results. We learned at last week's meeting about a couple of items that are not yet funded for school safety. So last night, my colleagues and I on council, we finalized the next fiscal year's budget, and we were able to find funds from this fiscal year uh, to upgrade radio equipment and safety glass, uh, which we were able to fund again from this year's school surplus funds. So our school leadership can immediately begin the work on the procurement process for those critical needs. So tonight is less about a formal council committee meeting and more about bringing the community together in solidarity to foster healing and begin to turn our grief into action through a robust dialogue focused on finding solutions here in Nashville and joining with communities across the nation to work together towards putting an end to gun violence and mass shootings and protect our schools. So special thanks to Dr. Schuler uh, Pelliman, the teachers, staff, and especially the students here at Hills Hillsborough High School community for hosting our meeting this evening. Uh, I wanted to recognize our elected officials in the audience. I'll begin with Council Member Russ Pulley, whose district we are in tonight, and the wonderful investment that you see here at this school and the surrounding community. Our thanks to Council Member Russ Pulley's leadership. Help me thank Russ. Thank you, council member. Uh, we also have at large council member Berkeley Allen is here. Thank you so much, Berkeley. And school board member Frida Player is here. Thank you so much, Frida. So I am so thankful uh, for the attendance of our special guests this evening. So please help me welcome Michael Stevens, president of the Evaldi Foundation for Kids, Linda McFadden Ketchum, who leads the Tennessee chapter for Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America, and Dr. Gil Wright with our Metro Public Health Departments. So as you may have read in the press release and on socials or whatnot, we are going to have a fourth uh, panelist, uh, Sean Dell Brooks, founder of the Aquilas Da Silva Foundation, whose son was murdered in the Waffle House shooting five years ago. Her family is now enduring another uh, gun violence, and they are now enduring being victims of gun violence yet again, as Shondell's other son, Nebede, was shot last week. Thankfully, he is home and recovering. So we hold Shondell, Nebede, and their family close in our hearts as they once again heal. So I will now turn this over to Dr. Gilwright, our Director of Metro's Public Health Department, for some intros. Thank you, Council Member. Um, we are going to start this evening with just a few moments of contemplation, reflection, and uh, one of my staff, Shamika Tumblin, is going to lead that exercise. So, Shamika. Good evening, everyone. Um, so in light of the heaviness of tonight's conversation and to give everyone a chance to breathe and feel in their hearts and their mind and body what it is that they would like to speak on, as well as take the top of time and opportunity to take care of themselves, I would like to lead us in a mindfulness activity. And I'm just going to invite us to breathe together and take inventory of what's happening within our bodies. So I'm going to take this time to offer for everyone to gently um, but firmly place your feet on the ground. Your hands can rest in your lap on the sides of your chair, whichever you may, whichever one you may like. Um, and you can close your eyes or keep them open. Um, 
I will close my eyes, however, so I will not see any of you as we go through this activity. I'm going to invite us to take slow, deep breaths, breathing in through the nose and out through the mouth. We're going to take another deep breath in through our nose and out through our mouth. We're going to continue to take those deep, slow breaths. As you breathe, I want you to imagine that as you take your deep breath in, all the air and blood within your body is rising to your chest. And as you breathe out, you're releasing the tension through your mouth and allowing the clear air to flow to the organs of the body. And as you do that, I want you to take note of how it feels to come from your feet up to your chest and then back down again. And if you need to, wiggle your toes or kind of move your feet around just to take inventory of how light or heavy they may feel. And as you continue to take in these deep breaths, letting out tension and releasing the clean and clear air back through the body, I want you to take inventory of what your legs may feel like. Are there any tingling sensations? Maybe even a little burning from walking or standing for a while? And then continue to breathe. And as you let that air go, allow it to ease those sensations. Then take inventory of how you feel in your, your tummy area. Do you have butterflies or nerves? Does it feel calm? Breathing in. And exhaling, filling it with air. Then take an inventory of your chest and heart. How do they feel? Are you carrying with you some things that may have happened today? Maybe sitting in traffic? I want you to take a few deep, calming breaths and release that tension or those thoughts. Allowing your mind to drift and join us here in this room as we prepare to talk about what's happening in our community and our surrounding areas. And as you take your next couple of breaths, I want you to just take inventory of what you hear. And that could be your thoughts, the sounds in the room, maybe the person next to you breathing. And as you do so, I want you to welcome what you would like to be thinking about. Whether it be the things that you want to say tonight, or maybe you have a loved one that you are holding in your heart and you want to think about them for a second. And as we continue to breathe, I want to welcome you to open your eyes and join us here. And I just want to let you all know that throughout the night, as topics may get heavy, uh, this is an activity you can do, and no one has to know that you're calming yourself. Um, we also have individuals in the lobby. If you need to step out for a second and breathe or maybe shout or talk to someone, we're here. Um, and I just want to thank you all for joining me in this activity, and Dr. Wright, for you having me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shamika. Okay, so we're going to start and just let our two speakers here um, kind of tell a little bit of their story um, and uh, their organization. And so uh, I'm going to turn it over to the two of them. And Mike. thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Stevens. I'm the president of the board for the Duvaldi Foundation for Kids. So a little bit about the board for or the foundation. Um, 
We were born out of the tragedy that, that took place last year, almost a little over a year ago in, in Uvalde, Texas. Um, although we are, are not a, a memorial for, for their school, we, we operate similar to an Amber Alert where we use the, the, that tragedy um, as our rally cry to bring awareness and prevention um, to school violence, to include bullying, um, um, anything that happens online with students, of course, physical um, things that occur at school, on campus, and, and obviously very uh, dangerous violence that students unfortunately face, um, as, as all of you are well aware of. Um, our foundation has um, representatives or ambassadors, is what we call them, all over the country in the form of students, and we have adults and, um, and various um, uh, programs that we've implemented in, in K through 12 schools and in elementary, middle and high schools across the country um, in the short time that we've, we've been in operation. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm actually a headmaster at a private school. Um, I've spent most of my career working in public school, um, a little bit in private school. So um, this is personal to me. Um, not only as being as someone involved with the Valley Foundation for Kids, but this is something that I, I deal with every day, working with students and teachers and parents. I'm a father of three school-aged children as well. Well, two, one's in college now. That's something new to get used to, but he's still in school. Um, so I have, I, it, it's it, important to me, this topic, because it involves my livelihood, it involves my children, um, it involves what I do every single day, and it's important to me to ensure that when my kids go to school, when I come to school, my students, my, my, my teachers, my faculty, that they're walking into a safe environment and that they know that we've done everything that we possibly can to ensure that they are there for the primary objective, and that's to learn and or to teach. So thank you. I'm very excited to be here tonight. Um, despite the circumstances, thank you for having me. Thank you for the invitation, Councilman. I'm Linda McFadgen Ketchum. I am a um, co-lead for state legislative work for the organization Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America. I'm also the local group leader for our Middle Tennessee chapter. Before I go on, I want to bring greetings from Shondell Brooks, who should have been in this chair. She is recovering um, as best she can from the horrible trauma of a baby's shooting. Um, she said they had a doctor's appointment today. It didn't go well, not because of a baby. It was some kind of institutional confusion. Um, but they think they got it straightened out. She said to tell you she will never stop fighting. And you who know her know that's what she means. She has um, Aquila to fight for and now Abede. And uh, she will continue to speak and use her voice. I am a public school parent and a grandparent. I'm a gun violence survivor. Uh, my aunt and uncle died in a murder-suicide with a gun that no one knew my uncle had. A little bit after that, a good family friend was shot in the head in the Unitarian Church shooting in Knoxville about 12, 13 years ago. She made it, she survived. She was um, at church with her three and five-year-old in the pew in front of her. They were looking at a children's production of Annie and uh, at the Unitarian Church, and a man came in with a gun in, hidden in the, a guitar case. He had heard that the congregation was welcoming, that everyone was invited to be there, and he wanted to hurt people, and he did. Um, I believe he killed three people and injured eight more. He is, will be in prison for the rest of his life. Um, I was myself a teacher for many years. And I remember on many mornings how lucky I felt that I got to work in a building full of children. To me, that's much more appealing than a building full of adults 
um, children, it, you know, they are who they are, but they're typically pretty delightful. And it's, it's a privilege and a wonderful thing to, to spend your days and your hours and your years in a building full of children. I was a teacher at Schwab Elementary when Terrence Murray died at John Trotwood Moore, just up the road. And I remember how shocked we were. Uh, we didn't know of any other child who died in a shooting in a metro school, public or private. And for many years, he was the only one until March when Covenant came. My heart goes out to Uvalde and to Covenant and to all schools that have suffered shootings. Um, I'll say the Sandy Hook school shooting was the one that pushed me into pretty much full-time activism. Uh, I'll stop here before I tell you about my organization, or should I go on? Right ahead. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense in America was founded uh, just over 10 years ago, right after the Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. The, we are the grassroots arm of every town for gun safety. We have chapters in every state and 9 million members, friends, and supporters. We're not anti-gun. Many of our members are gun owners. You don't have to be a mom or a woman to join. Uh, we're mothers and others. There's some handouts that some of the moms will have after this um, meeting with information about how you can keep up with us or join us. We would love to have you. There is no fee associated with joining. You have to have gun sense, however. And that means you recognize that we can respect the Second Amendment and also have gun laws that keep us safe. Our work falls into three buckets. The first bucket is legislative work. The second bucket is teaching safe gun storage to adults. It's our Be Smart program. The third bucket is survivor support. I should have asked if anyone in the room would like to acknowledge that they are a survivor. I know I saw one of our first survivors come in. I don't know if she'd want to uh, raise her hand, but um, I don't see there. Okay. Oh, I see one, two. There's Talia. Talia, whose son graduated from this school and died in a drive-by at a Sweet 16 party. Right? What year? Thank you for being here. <laughs> um, we have just finished uh, the legislative session, and for me, it was my 10th. I, had, I had knew nothing about guns <laughs> except how to shoot a 22 until Sandy Hook. Now I know way too much about this very dreadful subject. I hate it, but it's what I'm doing. Um, so during the last session, we, um, we always have to pick and choose which bills we're going to oppose or support because there's usually 40 or 50 gun bills or gun-related bills filed in the General Assembly that's downtown at Cordell Hall in the Capitol, not talking to Metro Council here. Um, we did definitely work hard to oppose uh, a bill that would have lowered the carry gun carry age to 18. We think that's too young to be carrying a gun in public. Um, and also that same bill would have expanded gun carry from handgun to long gun. So we're talking assault style weapons could be, you know, outside the, in the, on the sidewalk, like that guy did when he marched up and down Hillsborough Road a while back with a, with a assault style weapon. Um, that bill did not pass in the legislature. There was a lot of appetite for it, I'll, say, I'll tell you that. But, but a court case that was signed by a federal judge in East Tennessee that did make it legal. So you should know that 18-year-olds can now carry guns in our state. They can't carry long guns, but they can, they can carry handguns. 
And if you know about permitless carry, you know that many of them will not have had a training class. So they will not know what they are doing. Um, we always oppose arming teachers and we did again this year. Um, we've held a line on that for several years and we hope we can continue to. We do support safe gun storage in cars and homes and boats. Um, we help put a bill together in the legislature um, sponsored by Senator Jeff Yarbrough and uh, House member Caleb Hemmer. Caleb, who was at John Trotwood Moore <laughs> on the day Terrence Murray was shot. Um, but the bill got sidelined and we hope to bring it back in August in a special session if that's going to be allowed. We did not file an extreme risk protection order law this year. Some people call them red flags. We call them ERPO, extreme risk protection order, because we knew we had to have a Republican sponsor to get anywhere with it. And we couldn't find not one. We could find no one uh, in the Republican uh, caucus to support us. And so we did not file it. And then Covenant came and everybody's talking about red flag and ERPO. So we were ready. We were in the wings waiting. Um, a bill did pass that gave a gun, that gives gun manufacturers some special protections uh, from civil lawsuits regarding their um, firearms that, they're, that they manufacture. That bill was in the works before Covenant. It, the timing of its passage was very unfortunate because it came after the tragedy at Covenant and it just seemed very tone deaf to pass something like that after what happened, but that's what they did. Um, in the upcoming session, here are the things we're going to be pushing for. And we, like everyone, are waiting on the governor to let us know what the boundaries will be because he has to issue a formal call that has parameters and you know anything that's outside the parameter will not be discussed. We're pushing for wide parameters because we think we need to discuss several things. Uh, the first would be an extreme risk protection order law, an ERPO law. It, it, you may know this, uh, it is a tool that people, family members and law enforcement could use in civil court to make the case to a judge that someone they know, a family member, or in the case of police, it could be someone they've met on a call, um, is in such a level, at such a level of distress that they are likely to harm others or themselves and therefore need to be separated for a time from their firearms. We know that many people who commit mass shootings and, and many people who take their own lives with guns often send up red flags. That's why we call it a red flag law. Um, people around them know that something is wrong and that the person, the person is frightening them. Um, an ERPO law might have helped in the covenant situation. I don't know that much about the shooter but I know that the shooter's parents were concerned about their guns, the number of guns that the person had in the home. And I believe I read that the person was being treated for emotional difficulties. Um, lots of people are treated for emotional dis difficulties, some of us in this room. So that's not a damning descriptor, but um, it sounds to me like this was a young person in trouble. Um, if you go back to the Waffle House shooting, that young man was definitely in trouble and many people knew it. He had tried to get into the White House, for goodness sakes. Um, he, um, he had lost his firearms um, ID card, which is um, required in Illinois where he was from, and so couldn't have guns, but his father gave them to him against the wishes and um, instructions of law enforcement. That father uh, has now been convicted uh, of a crime and will serve 18 months in prison for that. Doesn't seem like enough. 
um, when you think that four young people died. Um, but for sure, if any, I don't know how long the Waffle House shooter was here before he did what he did. I don't think long enough, but if we had, um, if somebody had known him well enough to have had concerns, we couldn't have gotten his guns because we don't have an ERPO here. Um, going back to the Burnett Chapel Church of Christ shooting in 2017, the sh that shooter's father had begged police to take his guns because the father feared the young man was going to take his own life. But the police couldn't because the young man seemed okay to them. They visited with him a couple of times in at home, and he seemed okay. Well, you know, that's a lot of um, responsibility to put on law enforcement to make that kind of decision, but they have to. Um, and so he didn't take his own life, but he did shoot up the church and killed one lady in the parking lot and injured others inside. Um, between 2015 and 2022, 32% of mass shootings in, a, in America, in those cases, the shooter did exhibit warning signs. So, you know, if that's a third. If we could reduce shootings by a third in the state of Tennessee because we had an ERPO law, I'd say, yeah, let's do it. That's a lot of people. A lot of suicides also could be averted. ERPO laws, you'll hear from the opposition that they don't provide due process protections. That means uh, usually the attention of the court. That's just wrong. The court is involved every step of the way. Due process is a very important part of ERPO. The, um, when a full hearing is held, the person of concern has much opportunity to explain him or herself. He or she can bring witnesses, can have legal counsel. It's a small trial, similar to the small trials that we do when someone wants an order of protection because they were afraid of their abuser. 21 states and the D District of Columbia have ERPOs now. Um, the only two that are like us are Indiana and Florida, and both of their ERPOs came about following horrible shootings. We started working on our ERPO about five years ago because we really, really, really wanted to avoid our Covenant or a Parkland or a Sandy Hook, but it's really difficult to pass legislation about something you think might happen. It, there's just no energy around it, but and now here we are, and now we're talking to ERPO because of what happened down the road. Um, the Indiana ERPO happened because a police officer in Indianapolis was gunned down by a man whose weapons had been removed. He was um, seriously mentally ill. His weapons had been removed, but then law enforcement had to return them to him and he killed his mother and then went out on the street with a gun. And of course, somebody called it in and um, Indianapolis police responded and they killed uh, Officer Jake Laird. And the, their bill is now called the Jake Laird Law. It's in his honor. And they believe that he would be alive today if they'd had such a bill, such a law at the time. Florida's uh, ERPO was passed after Parkland, very, very quickly after Parkland. Something about a terrible event like that moves people. It, we, it certainly has here, and it certainly did in Florida. But what a terrible thing that we have to be so stupid and so short-sighted to let these things happen before we do something. I guess that's human nature. I don't know. Um, so ERPO is number one on our list. Number two is safe storage. You think, you might think that the state requires you to lock up your guns. Well, it's not in the law anywhere. Um, I, when I first started learning about it, I thought, oh, sure. 
the law, surely there's a law that says if you're going to carry a gun or have one at home, you have to secure it. Well, there's not. So our bill would um, say that if you are foolish enough to leave a gun in a car and it gets stolen, then you've got to report it because the police need to know where guns are being stolen, obviously. And you need to go to a safety class. That's your penalty. I know that doesn't seem like much, but there may be people out there who do not know how to secure a firearm. It's hard to imagine, but there may be. We also, um, okay, you have to report it. What's the other one? Sorry. <laughs> anyway, we think that someone whose gun is stolen should have to report it within 24 hours and should have to uh, go through a safety class. Uh, we suspect that permitless carry is contributing to the uptick in um, stolen guns. The reason is that permitless carry doesn't require safety training. And if you go to a good safety class, you're going to hear a good bit about locking up your guns. Good safety uh, instructors are very um, committed to safety. And they do everything they can to, to make us safe. And so, but, you know, we've got people now wandering around with guns um, who've not been to class, and they just may not know. And also, they probably may not know how to safely fire their gun. But that's another topic, isn't it? <laughs> the last, that's number two, is safe storage. ERPO, safe storage. Number three is high-capacity magazines. Don't know if the Covenant shooter's family could have gotten an ERPO, but we sure know that if that shooter had not had high-capacity magazines, he or she could not have done the damage they did as quickly as they did. So we are going to uh, hopefully file a bill that would prohibit the sale of a magazine with more than 10 rounds. That's enough. <clears throat> that's too much to me, but that's enough. Keep going. Let's uh, take, a f take a little break and uh, we'll talk a little bit more. I've got uh, some of my staff that has collected some of the questions from out in the vestibule that people filled out when they came in. I'm going to collect those. Uh, I will say that uh, I do thank council last night when they voted. They did include $50,000 for gun locks. So uh, we will have those, uh, council and such will have those out and about uh, for the community. But the one question I wanted to ask while I get these questions, uh, the other questions was, I wanted Michael to tell us a little bit about he knows where he knows what their community went through and where we're at. I'd like him to talk a little bit about how should we be thinking, what should we be doing and, and preparing as we move forward at this point in time and uh, to give us a little bit of uh, feedback on that. Thank you so much. That's a that's an actually a, a wonderful question. Um, as you just heard her say, it, it takes a lot when you deal with, with government uh, at, at not just the state level, but at the federal level, of course, and, and the local level. And so what we decided to do as, as a foundation is instead of trying to wait on that, um, because you can argue there really hasn't been any significant positive changes since Columbine um, took place in 1999. There's been little things that have happened here or there, but collectively there hasn't really been any positive change. So after the, the Uvalde shooting, when we just, we established our, our, our foundation, our focus then turned to what can we do to help equip local schools, communities, districts to help them prevent this sort of activity from occurring in the schools. Um, as you had attested to earlier, there's red flags a lot of times. So some of our, our training in the, the um, programs that we implement are how do you identify those red flags? If you're a parent, if you're a student, if you're a faculty member at, on a campus, how do you identify those red flags? And then after you've identified them, what are the proper channels to go through to report what you know? Um, if, if, if a student comes across a, a video on TikTok or an Instagram or a message that a student sent them, which 
was the case in, in here uh, with the Covenant School with that the, the, the shooter had sent an Instagram message. And thankfully, that individual, you know, was able to call law enforcement and, and help, um, I, I personally believe, save lives because of the, the quick response, not only of that individual, but of course of law enforcement. But there's a lot of instances where that didn't happen. It didn't happen in Uvalde. The shooter had reached out to somebody, and I mean, they were in, in Europe, they were in Germany, um, that they reached out to. But that individual didn't know what to do with that information. And so educating people what to do that. And then the same thing with the school. If you're an administrator, if you're a teacher, what do you do if a student outcries to you? If someone comes to you and says, I think that so-and-so has a weapon or so-and-so is, is making threats online or look at this text or look at this picture that so-and-so sent to me, what do you do with that so that you don't just drop the ball? Because we've seen that, unfortunately, even this year in 2023, we've had 23 you know, students that have uh, or, or, or shootings that have occurred, excuse me, just in this year alone in 2023. And in some of those instances, administrators, teachers didn't really know what to do with the information that they received. And so that's one thing that we really need to do. We, we can't really force legislators. And, and that was really upsetting when I heard that, that you said you couldn't find one individual to say, you know what, let me help you out with this, with this bill. And, and we're not here, to, or at least I'm not here to talk about politics, but it, it's, if that's the channels and that is the channels that unfortunately we all have to go through, then we have to find alternatives to help prevent these things from occurring in the school. And then unfortunately, if they do, um, which they have occurred, um, We've had, I think there's 386 school shootings since Columbine alone in the United States. Is how do you change operations or the way that you're doing, uh, for lack of a better term, business at school so that when students return, when faculty return to the campus, whether it's in the same building or you relocate as they're doing in, in Uvalde, um, they're, they're relocating to another campus. How do you let everybody know it's not business as usual? Obviously, what we had in place didn't work. Obviously, all the procedures, the way that we, uh, our, our operations, our policies for, you know, school shootings and lockdowns, et cetera, all of that didn't work. So what do we do? What can we do in order to ensure that that does not occur again on our campuses? Unfortunately, there's not one answer. There's not one response to fix all of those, but it does take a community. It takes events like this. It takes teachers. It takes faculty. It takes parents. It takes students. It takes members of the community working together to say, we're, we're coming together. We're a team. We're here for our kids. We're here for our, our teachers, for our, our administrators, for our parents. And we want to make sure that they are safe places or that our, our students and parents are safe when they go to school. Thank you. Um, I would bring up or just mention a little bit. Um, we're going to be presenting next week to council, but uh, I will say that one of the things that you will hear, and, and I'm sure that both of them realize is in a large percentage of these cases, they are actually insiders, meaning that they went to that school. They were there. They went either went to it. They were there frequently or something else. Uh, and with a lot of these violence things, that happens regardless. And, you know, we've got six candles up here for the deaths uh, that occurred, but we really ought to have a seventh. There was another life lost, and it was a marginalized individual. And we find that a lot of these shootings occur because of the marginalization of somebody uh, that leads them into a state where they feel they have to act out. And so... We need to keep that in mind. So mental health is very important as a part of this, although only 15 to 20 percent of the individuals that commit these kinds of violent acts have a true prior diagnosis of a mental health injury illness. So we need to be able to identify these better. Uh, and we'll talk about a lot of this next week. But uh, I do have a question here and uh, wanted to ask that, which is, um, both of you have kind of unique experiences in pushing for legislative change. What do you see as being maybe the most effective? Uh, how, how can we uh, utilize what you've learned maybe in this community? 
limit? I will let you start. Well, I, I think survivor voices are the most powerful voices we have. Um, it's difficult for a legislator, if you're sitting across from him or her, to blow you off if you're telling a story of a loved one, if, if, it, if it were Talia telling about her son. It, people would listen to her. It, when Shondell speaks about her children being gunned or shot, she, they listen to her. Um, that's the first thing. Um, <laughs> There are legislators who will never be convinced, and I wouldn't waste my time on them. Uh, there are a few who just need to be encouraged and supported to be courageous, to you know not do what everybody in the caucus is doing, to, to go up against the caucus leader and say, no, I am gonna vote for this, or no, I'm not. Um, that's difficult to come by, but it can happen. But I wouldn't waste my time on those who are just very far gone. And there are quite a few of them at the Tennessee legislature. <laughs> Not all, but. Question again was, uh, what, what have you learned that we might, you might share with us about how to approach legislation and creating change? Well, I, I agree with, with survivor, you know, voice, but I, I also believe that one of the most important things that um, they need to be presented with is the reality of th this is going to happen again, unfortunately. It's not a, a an if, it's not, uh, well, maybe this will happen. It's statistically, it's going to happen again. So what are we going to do to prevent to do everything that we can to prevent, you know, as a principal of a, of a school, we have fire drills. Um, and, and our students, we do that monthly, they go out and, and we practice that, but that's not the only thing that we do. You know, we have our fire alarm systems. We make sure those are up to code. We have fire extinguishers. We have, you know, sprinklers, everything that goes into that to help prevent the spread of a fire on our campus. And it needs to be similar in terms of expressing that same preventiveness to our legislators. And they have to, unfortunately, we have to get them to buy in. And that's a horrible thing to say, but it's the reality of it. Of Our schools need the same sort of, and, and I'm using that metaphor of a of, of fire system. We need our own safety systems at our school to ensure that this doesn't happen again on our campuses. Or if it does because unfortunately, like I said, it, it, it statistically will happen, that we have secure measures in place, aside from just lockdowns. We've done lockdowns, and, and I've, done, I've been involved in lockdowns and active shooters and, and, and et cetera. But unfortunately, as you, you alluded to, or you, you had said, um, they're people from the inside. So they already know how all of that works for the most part, and they know the reactions and where you're supposed to go and what you're supposed to do. And so... I would go to say that some of those measures aren't extreme enough or they're not uh, um, effective enough, excuse me, um, on our school campuses because when, when if, if somebody knows what you're going to do or they're going to lock through this or they lock this door or they have this happening or teachers are going to do this and they already know that, um, in, in Uvalde, it was a little bit different situation where the, the shooter um, was able to... Um, get into the school just based off of a, a faulty you know door and that system um didn't didn't work as it should have and so there's a lot of things that go into it um and our legislators need to realize that this is a this is a problem because it's going to occur and we as as a people I'm, i said i wasn't going to say you know get into politics but i will say this it is very important to go out there and make sure that your voice is heard that you're active that you're voting and because it, we seem to go through this trend and and to me i was a senior when Columbine happened, I'm dating myself, but that's that's when it happened. I was a senior in high school, so that's when it really became a, a real to me in terms of school violence. I didn't really pay attention up to that point. But since then, 
as an adult, I've seen the same cycle happen. We have a school shooting. People get upset about it. It goes to legislation and it dies. It doesn't matter what state it's in. It doesn't, you know, sometimes people get upset with it. It goes all the way to Congress and people run for Congress saying, well, we're going to do this, this and that. And then it dies. And then the next school shooting happens and the same cycle repeats itself over and over and over again. And oftentimes we're still voting in the same individuals over and over and over again who use the same taglines to get to appeal to our emotions. But so it starts that we have to have a very strong voice. We need you need to have so many people behind you um, when when uh, legislation is in session, whenever they have a special session, we need to reach out. I'm not trying to get people to call your office, but we need to, to all of our elected officials and say, look, enough is enough. I'm a parent. I'm a grandparent. I'm a teacher. I'm a community member. I have kids that, that go to this school. I work at this school and I need to make sure that when I go to school and my child goes to school, that they're safe. I'm going to say one more thing and answer that is, is I think that we need to get them thinking the same way that a lot of our politicians thought after 9-11 when they decided, you know what, we have to we have to set the way we did security at the airport didn't work. We're going to have to think about giving up some of our things that 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 we like in terms of conveniences, some of the things that maybe we held on to in order to ensure that when we walk onto a plane, that that plane is safe. And that that aircraft isn't going to be used as a weapon. Same thing with our schools. Our politicians need to get that same mindset and that urgency that we need to ensure that our schools are safe. There are these bubbles of protection that when our kids walk into them, when our student, our teachers and faculty walk into them, that they are safe and secure. And that discussion needs to take place. And if it doesn't, then you need to vote in new people who will discuss it. So I think you perfectly described, uh, as it's described, uh, insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, but um, what, how do you feel like we can work to, to implement this change uh, and kind of continue that change? Do you have any thoughts on uh, how we might go about that? Um, because it does rot the cycles and cycles and cycles. And uh, it sounds like we need to have uh, a longer term memory, I guess, where we don't forget. So, Lena, do you have any? Our organization is working hard to connect with people who live in small towns in Tennessee and in the country. Um, for the most part, our city legislators are on board with gun reform. Um, there's a couple in Memphis that aren't and a couple in Knoxville, but for sure in Davidson County, we have wonderful senators and house members who are very much in favor of change. The opposition is in small towns in, in the country. And so one of the things we're trying is to get conversations going in small towns to find out, you know, where are people um, in those communities about this? Do they, do they care about what happened at Covenant? Do they, or do they think this won't happen in, in my consolidated high school? But you, we know it will. Um, so that, that's something that we are working on. And if you have contacts, friends, family, outside of Davidson County who would be interested in helping us with this, I would love to speak with you after this meeting and uh, see what we could get going. I, I do believe that denial is a, one of the strongest emotions or states of being that we humans um, live with. Um, people just don't think that they will have a family member taken. They don't think it'll happen at their school. They don't think, they just don't. And I guess that's a convenient way to live. <laughs> it's easy. You don't have to worry much, but it's not very intelligent uh, because these events do happen everywhere. And there will be another shooting. I mean, until we get this fixed, there will be 
Um, and so I, I encourage everyone to be a little bit more honest with yourself and think about and just pretend that it could happen to you because it really, really could. I was a young person during Vietnam and it seems to me what really turned that around was that every family in America had someone taken in that war, which is a terrible, it was a terrible thing. And, and again, foolish and short-sighted that we had to let it go that long. Do we have to have every family in America have a person taken in a shooting? We're getting there. Well, school safety shouldn't be um, a partisan issue, um, and, and I don't understand how it how it got there. Or, or I, I do, because when when you you talk to a politician, and um, I'm from Texas, I spent a lot of time at the Texas, or I did this last legislation to legislative session in the Texas House, and met with different representatives. A lot of them immediately equate well school safety to to gun control, and and nobody wants to be the the a state senator or state rep that introduces gun control, especially in Texas, right? I know Tennessee is not too too far behind, but you don't want to be that person, no matter what, if you are a Democrat, or Republican, independent, you don't want to be that person. But it's educating them that, look, this isn't, you forget about gun control. You don't even have to bring that in the conversation. This is about school safety. Will the Congress figure that out and let them know that school safety isn't just gun control. You don't have to be the individual that introduces gun control before the Texas House, before the Tex or the Tennessee House or whatever state nationally with our with with Congress. But there are other things that can be done in order to ensure that our schools are safe. And surely there's there are. are Obviously, there's been um, some of our legislators on, on Tennessee and in Texas and nationally that have introduced different things in, in regards to, you know, mental health or school security or, or school safety officers or whatever it, you know, may be it, a variety of those things. But a, a bill needs to be written and we need to look at, at, at it individually and make it real to them. I, I what you said about small towns is, is true and and. and even in big towns, it's not going to happen at my school. You know, Uvalde, Texas, it's a really small town. Um, it is probably one of the heaviest, I guess, has one of the heaviest law enforcement presence of any city in the state of Texas. Um, during that, that tragedy that was unfolding as it actively unfolded, there were hundreds, and it's not an exaggeration, hundreds of police officers that were there within 20, 30 minutes. You have the Texas State Police that has a huge presence in that area. You have the Uvalde Police, the city. You have the Uvalde County Police. You have the school. And then you have federal agents in, 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 as Border Patrol agents that are there, hundreds of them that are in the area that swarmed on that school. And so if any school should have been safe, if there should have been a very quick and very decisive police response, it should have been in, in Uvalde. Um, but again, it comes down to that, well, it's not going to happen here, or we're not prepared, or we're not ready, or we go through the motions, what I alluded to earlier, we have these, these in place. But when it comes to our legislators, I know that's the real thing, I'm going down these rabbit holes, I can talk about this, unfortunately, for a while. They have to see that, there. first of all, there is a need, and unfortunately, again, because we're dealing with politicians, they have to see that this isn't going to kill my political career <laughs> because I'm not talking about gun control. I'm talking about school safety. And although they, they, they can go together and, and maybe they should, we have to, if we really want to have something happen, in my opinion, we have to separate those two topics and we have to, to separate the gun control from school safety in order to get these politicians on board. Um, to do something for our schools and for our campuses to keep them safe. And so for me, I think that's that's a, a great first step. Whenever I've dealt with, um, you know, state legislatures um, and I've gone before them before other education um, things, school vouchers and state testing and 
funding and it's the most successful sessions that I've or conversations I've had is when I have data from that individual's district. Here's how your students are doing in your district. Here's what's happening here. And so when we present them with data, this is this is the the what's going on in your your district. This is what's happening in terms of, of shootings or violence. And, and it may not be gun violence at the school, but this is the bowling. This is the su uh, suicide rate amongst young people in your district. This is and, and go through those things with them so that they can have something tangible so that when they do decide um, and you know this writing you know bills they have to have something that says okay here's not just a random bill but here's data to support this bill this is why we need it this is what it's going to fix and this is almost like the five-year plan moving forward when we pass this bill or if we were to pass this bill this is going to be the solution that way they can get those um, those votes in the house um, in order to get that passed Thank you. And I liked the fact that you talked about more than just gun violence. I think that, you know, we have to understand that the more violence you're exposed to, the more violence you, that's what you learn. So that's very important to understand that this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's a whole bunch of, you know, underlying violence that's occurring routine day in, day out um, for a lot of these people. Um, one of the questions was, a lot of the feeling, at least, about um, how are you today, a lot of responses as to overwhelmed, uh, how can people understand the feelings in themselves and continue to work. Um, we have a handout out there. Um, there is some self-help uh, suggestions in there. Um, we have that one of my uh, staff members uh, who's a... Uh, clinical psychologist put those together for us uh, and actually put those together originally when we as the health department had a similar meeting with uh, child care providers because this the school happened here but churches child care other places wherever anybody congregates is a potential uh, site for something like this so um, that's out there and on the back is um, other service or other service providers that you can reach out to um, from safety hotline and, and others. So um, I think at this point, I don't have any other questions, council member. You, I think, have uh, something that you wanted to read. Test. I did. Uh, I wanted to recognize Councilmember Angie Henderson has joined us. Thank you so much. Did I miss any other elected officials earlier? Councilmember at large, Zolfat Sawara is here. And then Vice Mayor Jim Schulman is here. So thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, all right. So any other closing thoughts on uh, perhaps you could address um, as a nonprofit, as, as you formed, um, what was the. Uh, how did you go about that? And can you talk a little bit about being a nonprofit organization and how you work uh, to um, engage schools and, and public safety officials and, and whatnot um, so that we perhaps as a nonprofit community as well could, could learn from that a little bit? So um, as a nonprofit, we, we are actually a 100% volunteer run nobody in, in the Valley Foundation for kids including myself um, our founder receives any monetary contributions or anything from that's all volunteer based um, which is something that we're very proud of because the people that we have working for us are very passionate about what they're doing um, and one thing that we've been successful with over the past year is really getting into those grassroots um, we have student ambassadors and essentially what they are um, is they're spreading within their schools um, the awareness of, of anti-bullying that's where we started with is is, is anti-bullying um, because a lot of unfortunately these kids or even as they grow up into adults that decide to, to go out and, and, and perpetrate violence against their, their classmates, they feel like outcasts for some reason, or they maybe they were victims of bullying, uh, and, and they just feel unheard or unwanted, unloved, uncared for, like they don't belong. And so that was a great place for us as a foundation to really focus in and start was these anti-bullying 
um, campaigns. And we have several, and without going into all of them, we have a, a bunch of different programs that we have many of which center on that anti-bullying. So we have our student ambassadors um, and we have different programs that we, um, and, and I'm going to equate it similar to like a, like a club at a school. Um, you know, you have your robotics clubs and your you know, various clubs in a school. And so we have some of these same programs that we, uh, that these students and even some teachers we've connected with have started. And they focus again on anti-bullying, on violence prevention um, within the school, um, and also for identif helping identify some of these, these red flags that you see. And before anybody um, thinks it's not like it's a tattletale network, it's just how can we prevent in our school? What can we do? And it's this almost like a compassion network is, is really what I want to say. And, and how do we get people? And we have a, actually a, a toll-free number that people can call 24 hours a day, um, and we have volunteers that work on there. And if they need to talk, if they need to, maybe they report something, maybe some um, is is just really struggling with with it's just something they're they're dealing with and we don't we, we some calls we obviously need to pass on to other agencies um, or we pass on to professionals um, we don't just let anybody you know answer the phone and talk to somebody that needs additional um, help um, we also have uh, in place uh, with these programs um, one of the one of my favorite things is a volunteer organization like watchdogs a lot of schools have those um, in schools, we have we have some um, in, in Texas where there's mom groups, there's dad groups, there's we even have some um, ex-military that that have their own groups, and what they do is is they're there in the schools. Um, one in in my area, in my district, is called literally called Watchdogs. Right? That's what the name of the group, and they're um, a group of parents, many of who have been in law enforcement or in military um, training, and they volunteer at the school, but they're just as a, an extra layer of, of protection in terms of eyes. Um, they're there to watch. They, um, I know sometimes that I've gone into school and, and you know, they're like, where's your badge? And I'm like, well, who are you? But they had their watchdog and they're making sure. And I like it. I like that they're looking for it because I know that there's somebody else looking out for my child or, you know, at, at the school my wife works at and ensuring that there's that level of safety. So we, we do promote and we, we have programs like that. We have multiple programs that we want to basically go in and, and show people here's the tools that you can use to be that extra pair of eyes or to prevent bullying or to find the resources that you need if you're dealing with something if you're struggling with something if you need help if you need um, um a counseling almost and we, we do have some people on staff that work with that and then um, we also look at we, uh, some of our, our, our teams that we have specifically focus on after a tragedy occurred, what can we do to help out the school district in terms of ensuring that that never happens again? And so we have some of our, our crisis, well, we have a crisis response team that looks into those and, um, and they work with the school to say, okay, where, where was the breakdown? Where, where did this um, go wrong? What was the what was the, the the series of events or the event or what occurred that that ultimately led to this tragedy from happening and then we work with them and, and brainstorm with them because sometimes it's nice to have a, a another pair of eyes that's not there to judge that's not there to prosecute that's not there to condemn that's literally just there to help um and so we have a lot of volunteers on our staff um we have professionals um, you know, I'm, I'm in education and we have other educators. We have people that have, have been in the military and law enforcement. We have counselors. We have people that work with students in counseling. We have all kinds of individuals that volunteer with our, organ with our foundation, excuse me, to help provide those tools. Because again, we're not getting them from our, from our, our, our state, from our, our, our federal government. And so we, and that's kind of what our dream is. We'd love to be big enough to operate wherever and whenever we need to with these team of volunteers. So. Thank you. That's fantastic. Linda, any, any thoughts on that or closing thoughts about how Nashville can uh, support you all as you gallivant uh, from one side of the state to the other? <laughs> I have a, a pep talk. <laughs> sure. um, gun violence has become a way of life now. It's hard to keep the shooting straight. And to feel the sadness and the outrage that we should feel every time one of these happens. But it's definitely not normal and it's not something we should ever get used to. And it is not inevitable. 
this really is a pep talk. We can get the gun death and injury rate down. People made decisions that got us where we are now. And we, the people, can make better decisions that will save us, save our people. And that, to me, is that's what keeps me going. Um, I, I hope that you will use your voice. Um, there's a couple of volunteers in the lobby who have one of those magic QR codes. And if you will take a photo of it or do whatever we do with those, it will take you to the governor's portal. The governor, uh, let's take him at his word, says he wants to know what we want and what we think, and I think we should do that. So please do it. I do it at least once a week because uh, I have new thoughts about what might help. Um, hopefully somebody's reading those. I don't know. Um, the other thing you might do if you want to be connected to a key legislator here is to text um, the TN for Tennessee to 64433 and we will connect you to one of the leaders in the legislature and you can um, please talk to them about our need for an extreme risk protection order law. And of course, we hope you'll join us. We meet monthly. We, we're a great group of folks and uh, we'd love to have you. Thank you for this. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, Michael, any other final thoughts? Um, I guess my, my final thought is that we, no matter what happens or doesn't happen, that we can't give up. We have to continuously push and fight for, for our kids, for our grandkids, for our colleagues, for teachers, for educators, for, for our public. Um, it's, it's not getting any better. It is a reality for a lot of people. And we have to be that voice. We have to be so annoying to uh, the legislatures that they, they actually do something at, at some point. Um, I appreciate that, that you've done this, that you've obviously heard, and it's important, um, as well as every other, you know, elected official here this evening. Um, thank you. And that means a lot. And I'm sure that means a lot to your constituents because it's important to not just say, okay, yeah, I, I'm, I'm for that, which a lot of politicians do, but to show up and to act. Um, and, and for those of you that aren't elected officials, team up with them, find out how you can help them and support them and, and, and be there with them so that they know that they're not alone because they need to know that their constituents not only want this, but are willing to support and help and get involved in, into the um, action that is needed to, to make real change happen for our students and for just safety as a whole for our community. Well, I can't thank you all enough for being here, especially coming uh, from, from Evaldi. Um, we know that our city has been consistently on the defensive from our state government, and we need to find a way where Nashville can turn that around and lead. Um, and so partnering with you all, learning from you, um, is a great source of uh, comfort, strength, um, and guidance. So we, we thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate everybody being here. Um, our final meeting of the three meeting series will be back at the council chambers next Wednesday at four o'clock, Wednesday, June 28th. And we will be focusing on gun violence as a public health epidemic where Dr. Wright and his team uh, will be there. The mayor's office of community safety, our office of family safety, the mental health cooperative, and I'm happy to, to announce that uh, Aurora Vasquez, Vice President of State Policy and Engagement with the Sandy Hook Promise, will be joining us as well. So I hope you will join us in the council chamber uh, at 4 o'clock uh, next Wednesday, the, the 28th. Um, the founder of the Valdi Foundation, Daniel Shapin, um, couldn't be here with us. And so he wrote a letter that he has asked me to read. And so to close us out uh, this evening, uh, I'm going to read this letter. So a letter to Nashville. On a tragic day, March 27th of this year, a mass shooting at the Covenant School, a private Christian school in one of the many beautiful suburban Nashville communities, devastated and altered forever the lives of numerous families, mothers, fathers, brothers, friends, and countless community members. And this senseless act ended the lives of precious others, including students. 
the event has propelled into action many such as yourself in sessions like this as you engage here today. The daunting question remains, how do we end the violence taking our students' lives and devastating our communities? That day in Nashville also witnessed a nation focusing its sights a little more intently on the city. Only this time, the music we were listening to was more heartbreaking than we could handle. The shooting has marked one of the many across the nation devastating communities, not so unlike Nashville where more young lives were lost to school gun violence. Hence, the attention the Covenant School tragedy has drawn, sadly, stems out of a curiosity and more from a sad camaraderie. It is a sad truth that even those students at the Covenant School shooting who thankfully were not injured or killed still add to the over 335,000 other students and school communities from across the nation this year alone who have experienced gun violence in the schools since the 1999 Columbine High School shooting in Colorado. Nashville, your grief remains unique to you alone. Yet, in this effort to seek solutions to prevent violence from ending more student futures and continuing to devastate our communities, including yours, know that you are not alone. Nashville, you join a heartbreaking yet determined fraternity of school communities such as Evaldi, Texas, and others across the country who share, at least to some degree, your unique, your unique challenges in healing and learning about what exactly we can do to end what truly has become a public health crisis, seemingly spreading deeper through the generations in our communities from Nashville to Colorado to Evaldi. And sadly, even all the security measures and policy changes to increase school safety will never return our lost children to us. Yet, we must act if, as if our children tomorrow are to see any future at all. We must act for those who were lost and those who still are with us. In the wake of the Covenant School shooting, there, have been a there has been a renewed debate about gun control and school safety, both locally and nationally. Some have called for stricter gun laws, while others have argued for more armed security in schools or an increase in uh, school resource officers' presence. The shooting has also raised concerns about the mental health of students. Behavioral care attending to issues such as bullying and the need for better mental health support in schools and safety training, not merely for students, but for those teachers and staff dedicated to now risking their very lives for the students in classrooms throughout. The Nashville school shooting is a tragedy that has shaken the community and the nation. It is a reminder of the dangers of gun violence and the importance of taking steps to prevent future tragedies. We as a nation are in a defensive mode, responding more and more to incidents which reflect a public health crisis, an epidemic as we have never faced before, and its primary target has been our young people. As Nashville considers through this series and in the days to come how to contribute effectively and sustainably to the safety and welfare of its students, the paradigm must be re-examined and shifted to prevention, not reaction. The Evaldi Foundation for Kids believes that there are many areas which must be individually and collectively addressed when it comes to school, student and school community safety, including increased security measures, this could include installing metal detectors, hiring armed security guards, more SROs, and conducting regular safety drills, along with increased safety training and support for those who know students the best, their teachers. Mental health support. Schools should provide students with access to mental health resources, resources such as counseling and therapy. This, student, uh, this support must include teaching conflict resolution skills to students and empowering and training our teachers in identifying and addressing serious issues such as bullying and conflict resolution. And we must provide our teachers and staff with support as they navigate a curriculum they never signed up for, school violence. We must care for those who are caring for our children. Community involvement. Schools work with parents, community leaders, and law enforcement to create a safe and supportive environment for students. It is important to remember that there is no single solution to the problem of school violence. However, by taking these steps to increase security, provide mental health support, and involve the community, we can make our schools safer for all students. To this intent, 
The work of the Evaldi Foundation for Kids itself was birthed by a tragic May 2022 morning in Evaldi, Texas. Prior to Columbine High School, we had never as a nation experienced something such as this that we do in today's world. Tragically, now the term active shooter is now as commonplace as the very school books within our classrooms. However, just as educators seek to empower students in classrooms across the nation to bring their knowledge into the world for good, collectively, Nashville, Avaldi, Sandy Hook, and others must seek to bring the lessons we learn now earned to schools, communities across Nashville and the nation to end school violence before it happens. Together, we will change the culture of violence, not by policy change or hundreds of thousands of dollars spent on advanced school security systems alone, nor is there one solution. For much as is, as is the disease of alcoholism, whereby the drinking itself is proven to be but a symptom of the alcoholic's deeper issues contributing to the behavior itself, addressing gun violence must begin at those places before the fists are clenched or weapon is picked up. Back to the question posed earlier, how does Nashville change this crisis? Nashville, much like Evaldi, Columbine, Newport News, Sandy Hook, Denver, and the many others. We'll see change through a collective, aggressive, grassroots approach. We must work together along with our elected officials, whom we trust to effect change toward the united goal of safeguarding our students' lives and their futures. It is also noteworthy to consider that changing this culture of violence in Nashville and wherever our students go to school will not only come through those community representatives and leaders as those who sit before you in this session tonight, but even more so through the collective efforts of those who sit beside you. Our foundation has honored these heroes that responded to that faithful day in Nashville. We honor each of you as well. You are each heroes in so much as you continue to stand up for your students in Nashville and around this country. Evaldi, Texas, the foundation and the nation remains with you. There truly is work to be done our youth deserve as much from Daniel Shapin, founder of the Uvalde Foundation. So thank you again so much for being here. Dr. Wright, thank you. I will see you next week back in the council chambers. Thank you everyone for coming. I hope you have a good night. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.